know that the artificial urinary sphincter is the most predictable successful surgery in patients with incont severe incontinence, even after external beam radiation, after prior sling or AOS implantation. It has the largest body of evidence reporting long-term success, and the success rates and high patient satisfaction outweigh the need for revisions. These recommendations are based on a lot of studies, and I just would like to show two uh, reviews, the one here from Fanda R from the year 2013, where you clearly can see that the social continents uh, with the artificial urinary sphincter, and that means only a maximum of one pet um, in, um, per day is uh, almost 80%. And this was recently confirmed uh, by um, a study of Lee. It's also a meta-analysis and a systematic review, and he focused on patients after radical prostatectomy. And again, you see that the social dry rate is about 82%. However, we have a re-intervention rate of 26%. Though this is the literature of high volume centers, so how does the real world scenario look? And this is the AMS database on 20,000 uh, implants in the United States. And as you see, about 82% are performed by low volume implanters. That means these are surgeons who are doing less than five implants a year. The main approach is the perineal approach, followed by at least 32% of uh, penoscrotal approach. Here, the post-operative complications, the main complication is a cuff erosion, followed by fluid loss, subcuff atrophy, device infection, and herniation. And similar to what I have shown you in the review uh, literature, uh, the explantation and or revision rate is about 20%. So the um, uh, Kaplan-Meier device survival rates are not bad. Five years, 87.1%, and at 10 years, 78.3%. However, the penoscrotal approach and the tandem cuff had higher rates of device infection, cuff erosion, and fluid loss, and lower volume surgeons had higher cuff erosion rates. However, during multivariate analysis, only younger age of the patient, penoscrotal approach and tandem cuff were associated with device explantation and revision and not the surgeon's volume. So what are now results in complex situation? And what we investigated was the influence of comorbidities of the patient. Uh, what is the influence of the irradiation? the status post urethroplasty, what is the success rate and the complication rate of re-implantations, and then, of course, the last option we have, the transcorporal cuff. Before I go into the details of the study, I would like to shortly introduce uh, our approach and the technique we use. We usually use for the cuff implantation the uh, perineal uh, incision, and for the pump and the reservoir, a supraingual incision. We never use the penoscrotal approach. We always position the balloon intraperitoneally, never behind the muscle, the rectus muscle, because we believe that the intraperitoneal pressure is lower and this gives better results. We always use a pressure regulating balloon, and if the patient is right handed, we put the pump into the right <coughs> scrotum. Usually, uh, it's recommended to fill it with saline. We don't do it. We use ultravist, two, uh, 22 cc for a single cuff and 24 for a double cuff. And the reason is that you can clearly make a sphincter function. You see here on the left side, the, this is a, a double cuff that the cuffs are filled. And then the pump is used, and then the, cum the cuff's empty. And if you wait another five minutes and you do another picture, then you see that the cuffs are filled again, so you know that your sphincter is working properly. It also helps for troubleshooting. This is a patient who had an intact sphincter system, and when he came back, the system was empty, so it's clear that this patient had a fluid loss, and this is very easy to diagnose. We use the bladder neck for uh, cuff location uh, in neurogenic patients and also in females. 
And the membranous urethra is our favorite location. That means you need a little bit more an extensive mobilization. However, the cuff then is in a horizontal position. That means if the patient is sitting, he's not sitting on the cuff. So if he's standing up, he's not losing urine. We occasionally use the single bulba cuff, which is the main location worldwide used. And we use it sometimes uh, as an option for redos after a double cuff. The distal double cuff is our standard after irradiation, and the rational is to have the cuff positions far away from the irradiation field. And the double cuff means we have an increase of the surface of the pressure, thus we expect to have better continence rate, and I will show you that during my presentation. We also do it after re uh, anastomosis if the patient had an anastomotic stricture after radical prostatectomy or any previous incontinent surgery in that area. And the transcorporal cuff is at least our last option and the procedure we use for salvage. So to study the influence of the comorbidities, we did a retrospective analysis of uh, 208 implantation during a 4.5 year uh, period. As you see, we prefer the distal double cuff in the more complex cases. So two thirds of our patients received a distal double cuff and one third a membranous cuff. And at 36 months follow up, 81% of the sphincters were still in place. And when we compare the continents, objective and subjective, uh, subjective, you clearly see that there is an advantage for the double cuff for the reasons I already explained. And then we made a risk factor analysis and we found that a double cuff results in better um, continence rates and that the truser overactivity, which we have seen during urodynamic investigation before cuff implantation, is at risk for uh, uh, um, an incontinence uh, afterwards. Concerning explantation, we investigated age, ASA, diabetes mellitus, anticoagulant therapy, uh, and also double cuff versus single cuff. And we only found really age and anticoagulant therapy a significant risk factor for explantation. So to summarize this study, the double cuff signif had significantly higher continence rates. However, there was a tendency of higher complication, but that was not statistically significant. And age anticoagulant therapy um, are risk factors for explantation. Switching to irradiation, since 2009, we have a prospective database with 248 patients included. So we compared in this study only distal double cuffs and the whole collective showed no difference, uh, at least concerning age, other comorbidities, mean urine loss or prior surgeries. Here the complications and as you see, this is the collective here with the history of irradiation and here with a history of no irradiation, and there was no difference between the two groups. Concerning continents, again, history of uh, radiotherapy, no radiotherapy, you see the subjective continents 85.1% compared to 79%. Again, no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And concerning explantation, you see the green curve is the double cuff without, the patients with double cuff without irradiation, blue with irradiation, and again, no statistically significant difference. So we can conclude no difference concerning continence, complications, and explantation rate. The literature is a little bit different. There are studies who confirm our finding. However, there are two other papers out who showed that there is a significant higher irradiation rate. I would explain that, that in a majority of these studies, a single cuff was used and this single cuff usually is implanted closer to the irradiation field and then it's clear that you have a higher complication rate. And this is an argument for us to use the distal double cuff. Concerning previous urethroplasty, again, the same database. We had 17 patients with a buccal mucosa urethroplasty and here we have some difference in the collective, which I like to point out. 
So there were more patients in the group with Bacamucosa urethroplasty who had a diabetes mellitus. There were less patients after radical prostatectomies, and as one would expect, more patients who had a TURP in the collective with Bacamucosa urethroplasty, and also more patients who had a prior irradiation. Concerning the complications, Again, no difference between the two collectives. And the same is also true concerning the um, continence rates. No difference whether the patient had uh, a prior urethroplasty or not. So to conclude, no significant difference concerning continence, complications, and explantation rates in patients with prior urethroplasty using buccal mucosa and patients without. However, again, here the literature is not conclusive. There is a prospective multi-center study that had been published who confirmed our results, but there are also other data out who have seen that urethroplasty is a significant risk factor for a negative outcome. So concerning primary, secondary, and repeat implantation, we had 165 patients with a primary implantation. 46 was a secondary implantation, that means artificial urinary sphincter implantation after any other type of incontinent surgery, slings, proact, or whatever. And 24 patients with a repeat implantation, that means patient who had a sphincter implantation already before. And also in this collective, we haven't seen any significant difference in the complication rate. And you see here the three-year explantation survival rates, the repeat group, that means those patients who already had a sphincter before, have slightly lower rates, however, also not st statistically significant. But what we have seen is a significant higher continence rate after secondary AOS implantation. And this can easily be explained by the percentage of a distal double cuff as I have shown you, the distal double cuff is the preferred location when the membranous sphincter has failed. So then we do a distal double cuff. So you see that the percentage of distal double cuff in the group with a primary uh, artificial sphincter implantation is only about 58%, repeat 62%, and secondary much higher. So that is the reason why the group with a secondary implantation had better uh, continence rates, and this was statistically significant. Transcorporal cuff, we have a subgroup of 39 patients with a mean follow-up of 27 months. This is the most complex group, 61.5% with irradiation, 41% with urethral surgery, and 96% already after a distal double cuff. And the mean explantation-free survival was 83 months. Continence is worse than uh, with the other types of uh, cuffs. The objective continence was 54.5%, subjective 69. You remember we were in between 90 to 80% with a double cuff or with a membranous cuff, and the social continence was 70 8.8%. However, this is acceptable for this very complex group. So to summarize, the artificial urinary sphincter still remains the gold standard for treatment of severe male stress urinary incontinence. The distal double cuff in our hands had a significant higher continence rate, but a tendency to higher complication rates. Age and anticoagulant therapy are risk factors for explantation, and one has to explain that to the patient uh, before you do the implantation. He has to know about that higher risk. There is no significant difference concerning continence, complications, and explantation rate in irradiated versus non-irradiated patients in our series, at least when you use a distal double cuff far away outside of the irradiation field. We also have seen comparable results concerning continence complication and explantation rates in patients after urethroplasty with buccal mucosa. And there were also comparable complication explantation rates after primary, secondary, and repeat implantation. 
However, secondary implantation, again due to the distal double cuff, had better continence rate. The transcorporal cuff gives a little worse results, however, with an objective continence of 54.5% and a subjective continence of 69.7%, it's still an option before you switch over to a urinary diversion. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>